Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our 19th Festival of Science held in Rijeka. On behalf of the organizing board of the Festival of Science and on behalf of uh, Rijeka's Natural History Museum, that is co-organizer of this event. Uh, tonight we have with us uh, Maximilian Wagner, our colleague that comes from University of Graz. Uh, and uh, he will tell us something about uh, how it came to an amazing discovery of the whole group of vertebrates uh, um, that were not known earlier and that were discovered in the Mediterranean basin, which is one of the most um, mo best studied marine basins uh, in the world. So, Maximilian, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, I'm today I'm, I'm going to present you kind of the background story of uh, how we made a quite surprising discovery in, like Shelke already said, in one of the most uh, or best studied marine basins in the world, the Mediterranean Sea. And it's about fishes that live in gravel beaches, in intertidal gravel beaches, and um, yeah, and as you might have heard from my accent that I'm not my name, I'm not really Croatian, but most of my work uh, that I present here was done in Croatia. So I originally grew up in Austria, um, like on one of the, if you consider mentally, most far away places you can be to the sea in the middle of the Alps, in a place that's usually famous for skiing. Um, but as a student, I was already very much interested in marine life and fishes. And so it came to that I had the opportunity when I was around 17, still in high school, to join a small expedition to the island of Kruk, where we tried to study uh, small benthic fish, fish that live on the ground um, around the island. And specifically, we were looking for fish that uh, inhabit empty mussel shells, like you see in the right corner here. This fish is no larger than three centimeters in length. And we tried to catch them or try to, to uh, count them more or less by distributing plates all over the reef, like in the seagrass meadow here. And then we kind of imitated these empty mussel shells and tried to catch the fish. And this fish uh, I'm talking here is a so-called clingfish. And what exactly that is, I'm going to tell you right in a minute. But just that you see my, my, my interest was actually uh, always in this very small fish and from early on. This was also the reason why I took up studying biology at the University of Graz and I made a master's in ecology and evolution uh, after my bachelor's. Um, in between my now, so I'm now a PhD student in the joint framework between the University of Graz and the University of Antwerp. And in between, I was involved in an environmental education um, program from the NGO Mare Mundi on the uh, Mari Mundi Field Station in Krk that I also had kind of to establish. And I'm quite proud of this project. And once you are maybe visiting Krk, you can also come to Punat after this whole COVID situation has become better. Um, we hopefully can reopen the station again. And um, yeah, that's what, what, what kind of also triggered my, my interest in marine life. And yeah, since 2019, I got an, a stipend from the Austrian Academy of Science, and I was allowed to work further on this group of fishes that really interests me, um, the clingfishes. And the fascination for clingfishes can be summarized very nicely by a small quote from one famous ichthyologist who died uh, recently at the age of 98, John C. Briggs where he wrote in his monograph of the clingfishes that he has had the privilege of working on a valuable and beautiful group of fishes, but their value is not economic, but biological, and their beauty lies in the marvelous adaptations to their habitats. And 
this quote really nicely summarizes what, what also this talk will be about. So clingfishes uh, are called clingfishes because, yeah, they like to cling. So they have a sucking apparatus on the ventral part of the body that is made up of the parts of the pectoral and ventral fins. And some species like this on the uh, corner right, in the right upper corner, can lift up to 120 times of its own body weight uh, just with this sucking disc. So I have also to mention, so this is a dead fish. Um, it's not alive, so it's nobody has to worry that this fish was harmed. Um, but it's just to show how amazing this sucking force is. And this is mainly due to the lifestyle of these fishes. Many of these cling fishes live in a very energetic environment. So the intertidal, some even went up to streams. And this sucker, this sucking disc allowed them to invade into this uh, habit, uh, environments. Talking about environments, so clingfishes are generally not considered as very species rich. So we talk about 180 species worldwide, but in recent years, more and more species are discovered, like also you will hear soon. But yeah, overall, compared to other fish families, this is like not a huge number, but that has two reasons. And the first reason is they live very cryptic. They have a very hidden lifestyle, so they are very difficult to find. And the second thing is they are very small. So most fishes don't grow larger than five centimeters. But, and that's very interesting, even though it's not very species rich group, they are still interesting to study because they represent this very nice ecological diversity, meaning that many of these fishes are specialized to certain environments that they invaded. And this very nice ecological diversity can also be seen in Mediterranean clingfishes, and uh, where we have several species present. And I just depicted some of the genera that are present in the Mediterranean to show you how specialized some of these are. Like for instance, this Opertogenes here, in the right corner is specialized to live on seagrass leaves. So it's a very elongated green fish that perfectly fits on, on Posidonia leaves. That's where it occurs. Others like this on the right upper corner here, lives in uh, between spines of sea urchins. Then there is this one that lives in the empty mussel shells. Um, the one here, the second one, sorry, the second one here um, is one that is very often seen by people who turn stones and during snorkeling. So some of the people who listen here and go out snorkeling a lot might have seen this fish already. It's a Lepidogaster. But the one I'm most interested in, or like my study organism is this one here, and that's the genus Guania um, that occurs in pebbles and show, uh, shallow boulders all across the Mediterranean Sea. So this is a typical habitat of Guania. So a pebble beach with several layers of pebbles. And in the first view, it looks very unremarkable, but when you take a closer look, there are almost up to 25 individuals on one square meter of this fish. So all of you who went to a very healthy and, and, and stable gravel beach somewhere in, along the Adriatic coast for sure stepped on these fishes, just that you are aware that they are kind of everywhere you go. The fish itself looks like this. It has a very slender, worm-like, elongated body. It lacks, like many other of these uh, bottom-dwelling fish, a swim bladder, so it's really adapted to live on the bottom. Uh, we call it a benthic lifestyle. And as you can see, also guania lacks certain fins, so we don't. They, they lost in the, in the course of the evolutionary history. They lost the dorsal fin. And, and the anal fin, for instance, 
and yeah, they reduced also uh, other body parts, like for instance, the eyes size is quite small. Um, and yeah, this their very flexible body allows them to really live in this interstitial of these pebble beaches. And Guania is indeed kind of unique because this interstitial intertidal lifestyle has only evolved twice on the whole globe. And the one time it happened is in the Mediterranean Sea uh, with Guania. And the other time it's a Jap on the Japanese coast, uh, it's a Gobi, so a completely different family that evolved in the same uh, way like Guania did. And what I mean with they evolved in the same way can be seen here. Um, it's a small quiz. If you can spot the Guania on the picture, um, because the resemblance of Guania and Lucio Gobius is very similar, the overall resemblance, because they really live in the same habitat, even though this, com this evolved completely independent, so um, because these two fishes are not closely related to each other. So the guanias, are those on these pictures here, the others are Lucio Gobius, and this is just to show you how amazing it is if the same environmental pressures on different organisms can lead to this identical output if the uh, pressure is high enough. And that's of course because intertidal gravel beaches are one of the most life hostile environments on this planet. Um, and just as an example, on the right side here are two pictures and the upper picture shows a, a spot we were sampling in Banyul Sur Meer uh, in 2016 on a very calm day. You see there are no waves, it's very, very, very nice. And on the next day, a big thunderstorm came in. And as you can see, there were like two meter high waves and, and very, very rough conditions. And it's not only this mechanical disturbances, it's also during this very calm days, you have a tidal, you have tides changing the water levels, you can have salinity fluctuations depending on, on, on if it's raining or not, and of course, temperature fluctuations. So this all together shape this very special uh, lifestyle of Guania and also Lucio Govius. But this talk now focuses mainly on Guania. The Species Guania, or, or the, the genus Guania, or better, the, the first species in this Guania complex was described already 200 years ago by Giuseppe Antonio Risso in his very famous work about the ichthyology of Nis, where he described 14 new species, and it's, it's really like a very a historically very important work for ichthyologists because of this 50 new species, but also because uh, uh, Risso delivers some very, very nice um, drawings and descriptions of, of these fishes. Um, and he named the fish, it was back then, it was in a different uh, genus, it was called Leporogasta, but that's not so important for now. But he called the name because a species name is always um, comprised of two parts. So the first part gives you the genus name, so in that case Guania. The second part is then the species specific name, um, that's in that case Villenovi. And Villenovi was a famous botanist in his times um, and also still is. He was also, for instance, the, found, uh, the, the director of the Royal Botanical Garden in Berlin um, at the end, and one of the mentors of the great scientist Alexander Humboldt. And when I was in a workshop in Berlin uh, a couple of years ago, I went into the lobby and I saw this gravestone of Dr. Karl Ludwig Willenow, um, which was kind of interesting to see because I was there for uh, learning a method that I use now for my 
for my PhD thesis. So kind of destiny that I made it to this to this place. However, the description itself that uh, Rizzo delivered was kind of a little bit fanciful. So, but of course, the language was normal for that for descriptions of the time. But like the mouth is wide and the jaws are filled up with sharp teeth, for instance, or or uh, the top of the body is like a dead leaf with dark waves on which there are thin red dots at regular intervals. So I personally never seen these red dots at any of the specimens we were investigating, but it might have been just an artifact of, of, of the fixation, for instance. But the main problem arose in the, in the upcoming years when other people tried to determine this fish uh, where it was the drawing. And as you can see, Rissa usually has some very nice and detailed drawings but somehow he messed up this drawing of Guania Villanovi. And from that on, many other authors, like they described species, and then it turned out it's anyway this Guania Villanovi, and that made kind of a huge mess. So in the end, it's just like, except for last year when we published our work, there was only one species described. It's the Guania Villanovi. Um, and we knew that it's restricted to the Mediterranean intertidal beaches. Um, we also call that it's an endemic fish, so a fish that uh, has a restricted distribution range. Um, yeah, that the body shape, it's reduced eye size, warm like elongated body, and a recently re in, uh, rediscovered sexual dimorphism that you can see on the right here. So a sexual dimorphism is just uh, a morphological divergence between males and females. And this is like males have, males of Guania have this finger-like, seemingly perfused extensions on the edges of their sucking disc. So this is a fish from the ventral side. Um, so the, the bottom, uh, the bottom directed side and females don't have this finger-like extensions. And these finger-like extensions were actually also the reason why I got into this uh, genus and into this group of fishes. Because um, when, re when talking to Robert Hofrichter, Robert Hofrichter kind of rediscovered this, uh, this trait with the finger-like extensions. So this is a, a scan of his PhD thesis from 1995. And he says like, these finger-like extensions have only been reported from individuals from Messina, so from Italy, but not from the specimens of Krk. And for instance, this 49 number here, this was a uh, individual of Krk, and on the right side you can see Robert Hofrichter uh, doing research for his PhD in Glavotok at the, at the wall in Glavotok, maybe, maybe some of you you have been there. Um, people who live close to Rijeka might know the small monastery in Klavodok, and, and that's where he conducted his research. And he came to me and said, like, so why don't you look with some more modern techniques, like DNA-based genetic techniques, uh, what, what this is about? So maybe there is like a, a difference between the, maybe these are two different species. So when talking about genetic methods, one very simple method that allows you to quickly assign species, um, unknown species, uh, to, to what is known as a DNA barcoding approach. So compared to, you, of course, one could like collect the fish and then uh, look at the morphology, like look what, what does the fish look like, and then compare the morphology. But very often, if two, if, if like nothing is known, like in the case of Guania, it's much more feasible to, to use genetic methods because you get more information or quicker information um, about the species composition in your sample. And in general, it's a three-step approach. So you take the species, you want to know 
what it is, like for instance a fly, then you extract the DNA out of it, then you copy a certain or amplify a certain stretch of the DNA that is called the DNA barcoding region. Um, and why it's called like that, I will come up back soon. And then you compare this region with other known uh, DNA barcode sequences. And then you could say, for instance, okay, this fly was already described. It's a Drosophila Suzuki. And this comparison between DNA sequences looks like this. So this is a real, uh, real extraction of, of, of my work. So what you see here, each line is one individual, one individual barcode, but in originally it's like 400 base pairs long. This is just a short, short, uh, yeah, just a short fragment that is shown here. And as you can see here, the highlighted regions are regions that are polymorph between different groups. And here you can already assign, for instance, this fish in the fifth line, may belong, let me use the laser pointer here. So this fish here in this line may be closely, more closely related to this fish here because they are identical in the sequence. And the first four with this, and then you can go further, like this might be closer related to this one here. And based on this, you can uh, identify very quickly unknown species. And this is why it's called the DNA barcode, because it's a unique sequence of, of base pairs that's unique for, for one species. And we did that, and that was when it became quite surprising, because we didn't find only one species there, but three, three very divergent species that are separated for quite a quite quite a, a long time, um, and so this made up of these samples from Messina. I also got some from Banjul Somer that were closely related to Messina, and then we found two clusters or two species on the island of Krk, and that was really really surprising for that moment. So it's indeed Guania villanovi is not one species, but at least three. So we said, OK, maybe it's worth sampling further. And we went out and uh, collected throughout the whole Mediterranean, um, mainly also in the eastern Mediterranean in, in Greece. And here you can see also some of these sampling sites. Um, so usually, we sample it very calm water. But if you take a closer look, you see people here and here. And here you cannot see it really good, but there is always a bucket with them. And that's exactly how we collect this fish. So we use a, a simple bucket and dig with the bucket into the sediment. And then we use a, a beach towel and kind of separate the fish from the sediment from the beach towel. So it turned out this is a very efficient way, even though after a long sample trip, also the bucket uh, kind of gets destroyed. But overall, this is a very simple method. And maybe if you, if you like, next time you go to the beach and you think like, this looks like a nice beach, take a bucket and try it on your own. It's actually not so difficult. But yeah, it needs the it needs a good sediment, then it then it works out. So we had this sample of the whole Mediterranean Sea, and I will guide you quickly through this phylogenetic tree on the right. So what you see here is so-called outgroup species. And that's the next closely related species to the genus Guania. That's the Lepidogaster that, that maybe some of you have seen already during snorkeling when turning stones. And Lepidogaster consists of two species. These are these two branches, as they are called here. And Guania, we had this one from the Adriatic, the second one from the Adriatic from Krk. Then we have these ones from 
the Western Mediterranean, meaning from Israel, uh, from Messina, and from from Banyul Sur Mer. And then we found another two very divergent species from the Eastern Mediterranean. And so, according to this, it is became even better because instead of one Guania turned out to be five highly divergent lineages or species. And the matrix here on the left simply shows the level of divergence in percent of this fragment. So for instance, in the, in the average difference between the one Adriatic species to the other on this particular barcoding sequence was around 14%. And this number alone doesn't tell a lot, but usually you should know that uh, new species are described, new fish species are sometimes described by a divergence level of 2%, meaning that only 2% differences are between the one to the other species on this barcoding sequence region. So we have really, really uh, divergent and old species here. This brings me straight now to uh, the work I did together with the Natural History Museum in Rijeka, particularly with Marcelo Kovacic. Um, I really want to thank in this, uh, in this, uh, with this, with this slide because Marcelo really helped me a lot and without him, this, this revision, this taxonomical revision, as it's called in scientific terms, like giving, finding the right names and, 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 and describing species, um, that was only possible with the help of Marcello. And you usually, so the process is very straightforward. You collect samples, you bring them to the lab, you take standardized pictures, you measure a lot of stuff, like for instance, the, 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 the length of the fish, the width of the head, the width of the body, the depth of the body, the depth of the head. Uh, you count certain stuff, like for instance, how many rays are there in the pectoral fins? How many rays are there in the, in the caudal fins, for instance? How many pores and how many, uh, yeah, how many pores does this fish have? And and then you also try to find certain characters that distinguish your species from from each other. Like for instance, here in Guania, you can see this tip at the operculum at this fish. This is absent. Here it's more or less of equal length. Here you have one upper and like only a small lower tip, these, these things you are looking at. And in the end, you try to give them names. And because the original description of Guania Vildenovi was quite fanciful, and uh, we decided to make a redescription, like not changing the name, like the name stays the same, but we redescribe the species based on the characteristics uh, we were looking at. And when I did a literature search, it turned out that in 1827, there has already been a fish described, a guania described from Robin and by Nardo. And Nardo describes that, it's a very funny story also, that the locals call them porchetti, so small, uh, piglets or piglets. So, and this is why we uh, gave it the English name here, the piglet sucker for this fish here. Um, but yeah, so we redescribed two species and we, we gave new names to three species. And the one here is Guania Adriatica because it occurs mainly in the Adriatic Sea. The next closely related is Orientalis that of course, many in the eastern, uh, or is restricted to the eastern Mediterranean basin. And then we gave one name to Guania Hofrichteri, uh, 
in in honor to to Robert Hofrichter, who actually uh, made kind of uh, brought us to this topic. So we have now the entities, the species names, but what's really interesting is now what evolutionary processes shape this diversity in Guania and how is this diversity maintained? In order to do this, I quickly uh, go back a little bit and talk about population connectivity in the sea. So a marine environment compared to a terrestrial environment like this here, and this is a very nice picture that was made from a friend of mine from the island of Plavnik with a drone. It seems like marine environments are not so well structured like terrestrial environments. So imagine you are a, like a, a mouse, for instance, and you live in this bay. You cannot simply run over to this bay because there are certain walls there that doesn't, don't allow you to, to go over there. So this kind of, uh, this, this restricts certain populations to certain places. Imagine now you're a fish and you're a good swimmer. You could easily swim from this bay to this bay. So you could exchange your genes from if you come from these populations easily with this population here. And so overall, this led to the paradox that people often think that marine environments are much more connected or populations in marine environments are much more connected compared to land. But this is not always the case. Marine environments are very highly structured, particular seasonal um, basins or, or basins that are that are basins that are uh, that, that have seasonal fluctuations, for instance, in winds and so on, like the Mediterranean Sea. And of course, I mean, larger fish or fishes that live in the free water column, pelagic fishes usually have the opportunity to overcome these barriers. But what about the small benthic fishes that kind of like guania are very bad swimmers? So, of course, these fishes cannot swim very far. They don't even have, uh, like, they, they even have reduced fins, so, so their swimming capacity is very low. And in addition to that, um, yeah, they stay anyway very close to, to, their, to their habitats. And also they breed there and they breed on, on small pebbles like here. We found a nest last year in Pula, for instance, where Guania, like the males usually defend such nests and the females come and lay their eggs. And from these eggs, larvae hatch. And actually, this is the only period they can uh, disperse over larger distances. This is the only, only time in the life cycle when they can exchange genes over larger distances. And so the only possible way to disperse is during the so-called pelagic larval phase. And for Guania, it was estimated that this is very short, meaning only less than two weeks, that the larvae drift in the water column um, and they also don't drift very far out to the ocean. So what's, what's the consequence is that uh, these populations of guania are very much prone to, to geographically isolation, meaning that, for instance, if you have an original population, then you have a geographic barrier, meaning like a could be a mountain range, if you think of terrestrial animals or or a certain oceanic property. It can be a wind, for instance, that is steadily blowing and putting the larvae, like separating the larval pools of, of two populations. And at a certain point, this can lead to reproductive isolation between two species and in the ultimate case to the so-called 
speciation where new species uh, arise. And we see already that many uh, or that some Guania species, like the species occurring in the Adriatic Sea, uh, are very much restricted. So they really only occur in the Adriatic Basin. And Guania Adriatica, like for instance, has the southernmost point here on the island of Corfu. Guania Pigra uh, is the only uh, is is only in in the in the basin is only present in the basin, and we call it again an endemic species. So Guania pigra is, to the best of our knowledge at the moment, the only purely marine endemic fish of the Adriatic Sea. Um, and this is, of course, also probably a consequence of the very low uh, active dispersal abilities. Another question that comes up with this is, now we have these two species and they occur in exactly the same beaches. So at, I would say at 90% of all beaches we collected, uh, we sampled, we collected both species uh, at the same more or less place. Um, and that brings up another problem because from an evolutionary point of view, if two species that are closely related and hence share similar, similar uh, preferences for diet and so on and so forth, will eventually like will one com one species will eventually outcompete the others. So there have to be certain measures, certain uh, biological uh, barriers that maintain this two species, for instance, in the Adriatic Sea, but also in the two Eastern Mediterranean species. And we were asking if that maybe has to do with some kind of ecological specialization and why we came to this. Because when we looked at the different uh, shapes of the, of the fish, we detected two main uh, phenotypes, so two main morphologies, one that is very slender. These are these two here, this Guania hofrichteri and Guania pigra. And on the other hand, this what we call stout morphologies. And the interesting part is that if the species co-occur, like if there is an overlap of two species, there is always one stout species with a slender and this happens in the Eastern Basin and in the, in the Adriatic Sea. And then we do have kind of an intermediate phenotype, but that is more stout also in the Western Basin where only Guania Villanova, so the only species from there occurs. The same applies to eye size and number of vertebrae. So again, we do have the stout morphs have larger eyes compared to the slender morphs, and we have an intermediate phenotype that is from the Western Mediterranean, uh, and the slender morphs also have a uh, higher, num higher number of vertebrae compared to the stout morphs, with again an intermediate phenotype um, represented by the Western Mediterranean basin. And what is shown here, this is again a phylogenetic tree similar to the one I showed you before that just shows these very five species and also again these outgroups. And when we plot these morphologies onto this phylogeny, we see that this has evolved independently or repeatedly in these two regions. So eventually the same selective pressures led to the same outcome uh, in, in morphologies. So we do have this very different morphologies present in areas of species overlap, but we still don't know what the ecological meaning of that is. And that was studied by a master student last year, uh, Maya Pamic from the University of Zagreb. And she was asking the questions, are these different phenotypes associated with potential pebble beach microhabitats? Um, and two 
two assumptions brought to this hypothesis, and that's uh, small eyes are adaptations to low light habitats, meaning that with a smaller gravel size, uh, light becomes less, and so um, eyes might not be that important, so eye size decreases, whereas visual predation, like here in is is more important here in in uh, in coarser gravel, for instance. So what we would expect is that we have two major. So we have one axis, the gravel size, and we have two uh, species. So the one occurs more on the coarser, the other one more on the finer gravel. And Maya was looking at that by. Um, so each time she collected a fish, she would also record the sediment composition by using a sieve apparatus that allows you to, uh, to measure the amount of, of respective uh, sediment fractions for, for each uh, bucket that she used. So she used also a bucket. Maya even made it a little bit better. She she kind of built a, sh a shovel here on top um, that, that made it even more efficient, the sampling. Surprisingly, uh, we couldn't find a very large discrepancy in the in the in the in the microhabitat choice of the two species. So what you see here is a large overlap. So this is just a statistic that summarizes all the parameter that Maya were collecting. And you can see that there is a large overlap in the microhabitat of the two species. But when we were looking at the body sizes that Maya, because Maya also measured the, the length of the fish, um, we see or we found that length or the body size might play an important role there because maybe this body size has, uh, has this effect that smaller fish or larvae of Guania adriatica that are smaller recruit into similar areas that do Guania pigra, but then they switch their habitat once they are older. And maybe also this sheds light on other aspects that also uh, that also separate the two species that we have not yet studied. For instance, diet. And this brings me to the last point of my talk. It's about threats and conservation of pebble beaches, because all what we found, of course, has in the recent years has become quite popular because more and more, uh, more and more, it, uh, so because more and more uh, people were aware that uh, changing the natural composition of pebble beaches has major impacts on the environment. And a major driver, of course, in Croatia and also in other countries, like I made this picture here in Albania, for instance at a pebble beach where we also found guania. Um, this has, of course, major impacts on the, on the species occurrence uh, on these beaches, or just simply building like after heavy storms that some certain beach areas have to be rearranged. Um, like here on the right side it was a beach in Pula. And this, of course, has major effects uh, on this uh, species composition. And I want to highlight a, a, a project here that I found recently. Um, it's called BeachX. It's a, it's a great initiative that already quantified here on this graph on the left, the total amount of supplied material in square meters from 2015 to 2019. And as you can see here on these spots that many, many beaches along the Croatian coastline have been artificially modified. Um, and some are, are heavily impacted, particularly here some in the south, um, which of course has direct implications to the whole fauna and flora that lives in these pebble beaches, or in the worst case, like here on the right side, 
this beach that was uh, supplied with sand. Um, that of course has huge impacts also not just on directly on the on the pebble beaches or on the natural coastline that is affected but on the whole coastline itself and surrounding ecosystems of these beaches. So what you can take home from all this, uh, it's overall like finding this, this new species was actually very, very surprising. And uh, considering that they are actually known for almost 200 years and nobody looked closer to it, it's worth mentioning that sometimes it's really worth to take a closer look at what hides underneath your feet. And I think that's also a very nice thing in science um, that sometimes the obvious is not really like the worst choice to study because you know you can everyone can just grab a bucket and dig into the sediment and find these fishes. So it's it's very very it was a very very surprising discovery. And with that, I want to say thank you for listening to this talk. Also, thanks a lot for, for the invitation or giving me the chance to, to talk to you. Uh, I need to thank the, the, the Austrian Academy of Science for funding my PhD project. My especially thanks to my supervisors um, and to many, many people who helped me in the past and also helped me now with my work and support me and yeah and especially also other like the German Ecological Society or the Nobis Austria who support me also with small research grants to conduct my research. Thank you and if there are questions I'm, I'm of course happy to to answer them. Thank you, Max. Um, so far, we haven't had any question from the audience, but in case something com comes up uh, later, we will let you know. All right. But thank you very much for your very interesting um, lecture and uh, the things you've shared with us. It was really great. <laughs> thank you. Should I stop sharing the screen? Or? Yeah. Uh, just a comment from our colleague Anna Lebicuretic. She says that she will not dare anymore to enter into the sea in Pebble Beach, just jump. And she says, uh, great work. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, you don't have to worry. I should have said that. So we do not harm these fish, of course. They are used to, it's much more dangerous for them if they you know if you really make large scale modifications of the beach um, because they also can endure hours out of the water it's no problem for them if there are long periods like in winter if you have extreme tides it can happen that they are two hours out of the water without problems so you can also walk on them and <laughs> it's no problem <laughs> Unless you do it on purpose. <laughs> Unless you do it for the science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thanks again, Max. It was great having you in the Festival of Science. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Yes. Another question from Marcelo. Yes, Marcelo, you can ask a question. This is our colleague from the museum, Marcelo Kovacic. And we are waiting for his question. Uh, what is the next in your Guania researches? What is going on already and what do you plan in the future? <laughs> Yeah, so directly I'm I'm I was lucky enough to that the that the guania was included into the vertebrate genomes project, which is an initiative to sequence not only like the single barcode that I showed, but the whole genome of the species. So we are trying to 
look into which genetic mechanisms, for instance, allowed guania to invade the intertidal. Um, that's, that's one thing uh, we are looking at. We also found some really nice, these fingers, for instance, unfortunately I didn't have time to talk about this, but these are very, very promising um, because they might represent uh, accessory breathing organs for males. And we are about to testing this and we also have genetic data on that and very nice morpho morphological data um, that clearly shows that these are nicely, like this could be at least used for breathing. Um, and yeah, we, we also want to dig deeper into this ecological part because I think guania could be a very nice indicator for let's say the healthiness of a beach, they are top predators and they, they live in these beaches and, and feed on, on all the small vertebrates, invertebrates that live there. So uh, it might be worth taking a closer look and compare, for instance, natural beaches with beaches that have been recently modified or, you know, just to get a, to get an, an overview of, of, uh, yeah, of what the, the community looks like and maybe also try to find out in which way guania really contributes to the to the ecological functioning of these beaches. Like what is the role? Are they really like I mean we know they are predators, but but you know, are they really so important like I presume they are? <laughs> yeah. Just a short overlook, uh, overview of what is planned. Well, I think that we will have a few more opportunities to listen about the development of the situation <laughs> in the yeah. next years. Looking really forward to, to come back and to Croatia. And, and yeah, hopefully this season won't be simply a computer season, but... <laughs> field work. Hopefully. So, thanks again. <laughs> and thanks to our audience that was really vivid this time. And uh, 